Um, quickly, my name is Srini Reddy. I'm a professor of marketing here, and I'm the director of the Center for Marketing Excellence, uh, which organizes these seminars, luncheon seminars, throughout the year. And so we're very, very glad to have Dan Paris uh, present, and I think it's a provocative title. It's almost sort of, uh, you think that maybe Terminator is here, huh? or he's going to talk about the Terminators that are actually going to come. Uh, in, in the future, but the rise of the machines, uh, uh, and Dan and I go way back, yes, yeah, so Dan works for um, uh, TBWA, yeah. um, it is one of the uh, major digital agencies for uh, Omnicom, yeah. Omnicom is one of the largest uh, ad agencies, as you, as you know, and uh, uh, we, we have a program with, uh, with Omnicom uh, for the last seven years, we just concluded uh, a digital marketing program uh, a few weeks ago, and Dan was the plenary speaker, so to speak. He's, he sort of started it off, and this was the topic that he chose to talk about, and I thought it was fascinating. It should be shared beyond um, what what we've done here for paying customers, so to speak. So the guys who came in, in for the program actually had paid for it to listen to Dan. So today, so pack. today <laughs> you're free. Not only are you getting it for free, but you're actually given box lunches along with it, so. A free lunch as well. <laughs> it's a free lunch as well. Uh, Dan has uh, 15 years of experience uh, at uh, TWBA, is that right? TBWA. TBWA, I always uh, get this mixed up. So, and in Singapore, so though he's English of origin, but it looks like he has spent a lot more time in Asia, not only in Singapore, but with his China, India, and uh, other parts of uh, Southeast Asia. And he's a business development guy, so I don't think the, the idea here is he works with a lot of major clients. Actually, in his bio, he doesn't list any of them by name, but you can also uh, al always assume that some of the examples that he brings in today and talks about essentially are some major, major uh, 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 firms that actually have uh, sought his help and the help of uh, his group. So, yeah, I, I, I always try to actually get something which is not in the bio, so and I actually probed a little bit. So I asked him, what do you do for fun, yeah, apart from getting more clients. And so one of the things he said is he's a, he's a club DJ in the music, okay? So maybe you should tell the club where they can come and see you at some point in time. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the other is mountain climbing. So a quite odd, oddball sort of uh, thing, but beyond, <laughs> beyond looking at right. But uh, he has a bucket list. He has actually done some mountain climbing and he has a few other things that he still would like to do, yeah. So I'm saying everything that he does, he can't go for two days and come back because some of the mountain climbing, you take a while because you need to get acclimatized to the climate, um, the, the elevation and so on. So I don't have the time nor the fitness to be able to do it, but I will actually admire from far what Dan does, okay? So without much ado, let me actually sort of uh, give him the uh, podium to actually talk because I was <coughs> absolutely fascinated with, with what he has to say uh, and, and many of the examples, I think, are, are, are still resonating with me, and I, I'll let him actually elaborate a little bit more. Okay? Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, for the call. Good. Yeah. So just, uh, just stick it anywhere, yeah. even though it's not. No, I just this is like, yeah, it's fun. I was actually interacting with it. Okay. okay. Okay, good afternoon everyone. Thanks very much for having me. Um, that's already what we told you I've been here for 15 years. I'm with proudly a Singaporean. Um, so we'll take you through, um, and the nice thing about today is I've got a lot of time, so we're going to take you through all the content. So I think that the digital works, um, I only had 20 minutes, so it was a bit of a sound bite when it came to the whole content. So this is, this is quite, quite a lot of depth. There's a lot of films, a lot of case studies, a lot of probing around, so hopefully you'll find this quite stimulating. So Professor Reddy and I come from an era where um, we had all this stuff. Should we turn these lights off? Is there any way to do that? Better experience without the lights. So we come from an era when, um, when this is what our world looked like. Um, and what's remarkable is how everything on that screen is now condensed to this one device. And on the back of that technology change, culture has now changed, right? So in my era, the idea of photographing my food, my mum would have clipped me around the back of the head before that. <laughs> she would have given me a right old back. But the reality is now you can't even go to a restaurant without the preliminary, it's almost like um, prayers for, um, for, uh, for food to be celebrated this way. 
The reality is that we are now drowning in a wall of content and imagery. Um, and there's one, I mean, you can look at the numbers, but there's one that I'd love you to look at here, which is by 2020, we're expecting about 82% of traffic to be video. Can you imagine the scale of what we're talking about when you look at these numbers? It's a phenomenal cultural shift. If you want to know what a minute on the internet, internet looks like right now, this is what it does look like. And there are some very interesting things starting to emerge. Um, the, 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 the rise of the voice-activated machines are starting to creep in. Um, but the numbers are quite remarkable in terms of what's happening around the world. We're also starting to see a new language appear. This is quite interesting. This is the average monthly emoji traffic on Twitter, like just one channel. This has nothing to do with Messenger or any of the other channels. This is just purely Twitter from August last year. This is the emoji traffic. And these numbers are accelerating considerably. So emoji is becoming its language by itself. One of the things that we spend a lot of time helping with clients is they often are asking us, you know, I'm not sure about digital, you know, we have all these kind of conversations. But late last year, internet access by mobile finally overtook desktop. So as far as I'm saying to my clients now, it's if the brief isn't mobile first, there's something wrong with the brief. So you need to think about, for the students here that are looking at marketing, mobile first is now actually official. I also work in a creative industry where we produce advertising and nobody wants their advertising. And this is the reason why, because all these ads, all these, uh, all these images are basically designed to intrude and nobody wants them to intrude. And um, you know, whether it's clickbait or hiding the, the, the closing sign to it's right down in the corner, um, pre-rolls, all sorts of stuff that we're trying to basically get people to, to do, is ended up with some amazing numbers. Basically, everyone in Asia now installs ad blockers. It's the biggest market by a long way in, for installing that kind of technology. But what we are seeing, because of the way the algorithms are working and the way that uh, people are consuming creative, is the, is the rise of the five-second brief. So if you can't solve the creative work in five seconds, it's not even worth considering that. So it's the, it's the new type of creative that we're seeing. The new type of creative individual that comes into our agency are now capable of thinking in five seconds. This is an agency that's now doing quite well in London and China, and they're called Five Seconds Worldwide. The only piece of work that they all accept is a five second brief. It doesn't matter whether it's a GIF, a TV spot, a free roll, it's five seconds, that's all they do. This is the reason why millennials don't want to work in traditional industries anymore. Because this is their average earnings for the number of followers that they have on the platforms. So if, you're, if you've got seven million followers on YouTube, you should be expecting to earn somewhere in the region of 300,000 US dollars. Which is why in our industry, spending a lot of time developing and looking for talent that wants to get involved in what we do is a huge part of our remit because I've watched a lot of people come in and out because all they're thinking about is this. Making films at home, playing around and building followers. And there are lots of people earning a fortune on Instagram. They haven't got, they haven't got Instagram members. But there are people now earning roughly £25,000 a week for doing three or four posts. It's a lot of money. But we're also seeing some fun technology coming out, which is, uh, so for example, when Trump came in, a lot of people realized that whenever he tweeted things about industry, the stock price of that organization went volatile. In fact, this is... <laughs> This is what happened to Toyota when they spoke about Toyota. So some tech guys got together and, and they basically created an algorithm to, to look at the effect of Trump's tweets on stock prices. And it's called Trump Cash. So you can download the app and it will give you a view as to what they, what they predict the stock price will happen. It's crazy, right? The point being is that technology has changed marketing forever. I'm a marketing guy, so I work for a marketing agency. And we are, this is now well underway. There is no pre-technology moment anymore. The idea of doing traditional advertising is absolutely absurd. In fact, in some respects to our clients, the idea of actually paying for media is absolutely absurd because there's creative ways of using technology to get around that. What is, what is fast becoming an important part of the way we're working with clients is that the competitor isn't the other guy anymore. The competitor is culture. 
how do you actually compete with the speed of what everyone's looking at on their devices? And that's the point. So the, the culture could be the, the cultural point could be Trump, it could be the eclipse, it could be whatever we want it to be. Fundamentally, those are the things that we're competing with. And this is a quote from um, our worldwide creative director, and I think this is probably one of the most important things that we're starting to understand right now, is that the scarcest commodity now of the near future will be human attention. We have literally got two seconds to make our point. And if you're not interested, you've moved on, because there's another, another person doing another point. It's brought out some interesting advertising, so I'm going to stop, finish this little section here with this film that's come out from Nike to play exactly back to the things I've just spoken about. This is brilliant. This commercial is just one minute out of the 10 hours a day you spent glued to your screens. That's 152 days a year. That's 32 years of your life. Scrolling stuff, clicking stuff, emojiing stuff, watching other people's pictures of their cafe macchiato, or their dog, or their baby, or their dog and baby, or the view out of their airplane window, or a rainbow, watching bloggers take something out of a box, watching reality shows, watching shows about housewives, watching shows about housewives in a different state, watching dragons, watching a year's worth of one show about a Colombian video businessman in one evening watching someone else playing a video game watching cats being cats swiping left 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 shake right left right deciding if a picture is a labradoodle or fried chicken deciding if a picture is a chihuahua or a muffin or a puppy or a bagel reading comments from someone you barely know posting about something you don't care about telling 647 people what's on your mind reading what's on the mind of 647 people reading a tremendous amount of opinions about politics Absolute genius piece of advertising, right? So simple, but completely about the culture I just talked about. Now, why has all this happened? We talk about 21st century brands. These are new breed of organizations. Um, you know who they are. They're the Ubers, the Airbnbs, the various organizations. And every single year, another one's coming out completely hacking traditional industry. And they're doing it because of technology. These guys have grown up in a very different world. What's remarkable, so for example, the first quarter of this year, 6.3 billion demand, on-demand rides were held, and 70% of them happened in China. That's just remarkable. It completely decimated the traditional taxi industry. These 21st century brands are quite unusual because um, they are fiercely entrepreneurial. They work in a very different way. So we've worked with a few of them now, Airbnb, Netflix, and they work in a very different way. They are product first. Everything is about their platform. Everything is about the way that they engage with people. They work at a speed that you can't imagine. The idea of going back to the agency and spending three weeks and looking at a creative brief and musing over what the strategy might be, it's, it's done the next day. It's as simple as that. And if it doesn't work, they will try it again, they will try it again, they will, and they will work, will work on it until, until the 40th iteration if they need to. Everyone's in. It's in a very evangelistic environment. They don't, they don't like this consensus building. We'll spend a year wandering around the halls trying to get everyone to agree to it. They are all in or you're not on. It's, it doesn't work like that. But fundamentally, they're product first and metrics driven. Experience is everything. So you know, when I go off to workshops and we stay in hotels and you know, it could be the Hilton, it could be whatever it is, it's really interesting that all the old guys the last thing they're going to do is move. They're going to stay in the same hotel at the same for the weekend. All the millennials go, that's got to be joking. They all move off to Airbnb. And it's fundamentally driven by the way Airbnb have created the market. So why would you stay in a Hilton hotel when 540,000 rooms are pretty much identical in every single place in the world, when you could stay in two million completely different experiences around the world? And that's the way that Airbnb have created their world. They've completely rewritten the way people look at travel. And it's still just down to the single app. Whoops. It's created an ecosystem of clients that have started changing the way they look at things. KLM, like any other airline, when it comes to the end of, their, uh, the, end of the airplanes, they scrap it for metal, they decommission it. But Airb um, KLM on this occasion took all the wiring out, all the seats out, turned it into an apartment and stuck it down the end of the runway and marketed it on Airbnb. And that is an airplane apartment you can stay at in Schiphol Airport. And on the back of just getting, rather than getting $1 million of scrap metal, they get $7 million worth of PR and engagement, right? It's a completely different way of looking at the value of things. Historically, the CFO would have decided, that's scrap metal, I want my $1 million. Now, the marketing guy's going, I'd rather get $7 million worth of exposure, which is more important to the business, which is more important to the way they're growing. Lufthansa took it on another stage. Lufthansa actually, they're marketing a night in the clouds at $790 
and they're paying Airbnb a service fee rather than to a travel agent. It's a completely different business model. Fascinating, right? And they're able to, so when you're looking at whatever city you're going to, so if you're looking at flying to New York and you're looking at places in New York, one of the things that will pop up on the feed will be the flight to New York with, with Lufthansa. So it's highly targeted. All down to the technology again. And they're always on. The one thing that we, we are now wired around is being 24 hours a day, completely on, following culture, following people, community managers everywhere. And one way or another, we are looking for any kind of opportunity that allows us to stay in the feed. So, I will, this is a precursor to the research that we did, um, and one of the contributors was Dane Lim from EDV. Still there. Very important part of what Singapore represents, which is to basically market Singapore to the outside world, and to bring these kind of organisations, these kind of thinkers, the kind of talent that we're all competing with, to bring them here to Singapore. But it's about this 21st century position. 21st century brands are very comfortable with the fact that not everything is going to be positive. It's a conversation they're prepared to, to accept and take on. It's a very different way of looking at traditional 20th century organisations which fear everything. Right, so we interviewed 12 CMOs and CEOs of quite large organisations based here in Singapore but representing um, Asia Pacific and eight themes came out. We did the research agency, Hall & Partners. These are the eight themes and these are the clients that we interviewed. And I'm going to take you through these eight themes, and I've got a lot of casework to re basically represent what those themes are about. Okay? And essentially, we'll start with the easy stuff, which is stuff that's going on everywhere now, and we'll end up with the sort of more future-looking stuff where it gets a bit more scary. Okay? Right, theme number one. And this is the, uh, the classic conversation we have with most clients, which is you've got to embrace your technological fears. It's surprising, actually, how frightened a lot of clients are about technology and what to do about it. Um, increasingly, we are suggesting to a lot of our clients it's about time that you had a chief technology officer or someone serious in the business that's driving the technology conversation. Because if you're not, you're completely out of whack. We're still having clients going, I'm not sure it should be mobile, when every single piece of data will tell you it's all about mobile. Right. The first thing, really, and this is um, one of the clients that we work with is Mastercard here in um, in Asia Pacific, and uh, Sam, who was working for Mastercard at the time, gave us a very good quote, which is the key to first is to first admit that we're no longer waiting for the rise of the smart machines, but frantically trying to adapt to it. So I'm going to give you two cases that I, rep that I think represent old-style organisations attempting to to use technology to make a really good connection. Lowe's is a destination sort of warehouse style DIY shop in America, right? And it's really old school America. This is um, these kind of guys buying their tools, buying their wood, and doing a lot of DIY at home. We don't really have a DIY culture in Singapore, um, but you can imagine the sort of culture that you get in the West where you can go to these places and just buy all sorts of stuff to fiddle around at home. They recognize that there's a whole new emerging millennial audience who are now up to 35, 36, if you define it from 1990 when millennials were, were first born, from 1980 when they were first born, um, and are starting to recognize that they have to engage with a completely new style of audience. And they chose to do it with Snapchat. This is about using Snapchat to educate millennials how to do DIY. So the film will, will explain it all.
superb piece of use of that technology in terms of marketing. Very, very clever. Um, and what was, what was also remarkable is the fact they could distribute that from a social point of view, but also make it available in store as a, as a piece of educational content. Just very, very smart use of technology. Dane gave us another quote, which is that successful brands are trying to shift the brand language from that of governance and guardianship to that of brand interaction and exchange with their clients, customers. And that's a very good example of exactly how that's, how it's done. This is a piece of work from our own agency in the Netherlands, from McDonald's. And again, one of the biggest challenges we have is McDonald's isn't seen as a particularly healthy environment for food. It's a bit of a fast food joint, so people don't stay around. And again, it's got that low interest for millennials in terms of what they offer. Now again, use of technology. This is the standard plate tray that comes, with a, comes in a tray. And using thermal ink technology, they were able to play around and make this into a piece of music. So look at how this works. Think about all the accomplishments, I can see you watching me. Approach everyone, positive, but if you can't pick your fan, you're not the man. <laughs> Creating music can really trigger creativity in young people. That's why McDonald's in the Netherlands introduced McTrax, a paper placemat turned into a full music production station. By the use of conductive ink on a piece of paper, we connected our placemat to your smartphone. Every touch point triggered a full sound bank to kickstart your creativity. Let's go, let's go. Just select the beat and you're good to go. Create your own sounds and melodies. Then you can tweak your track with any kind of effects. You can even record your own vocals. To the menu, I can get you something too. And you hear the beats play, what you say? That's how you play the place, man. That's <laughs> <laughs> so And this is how we challenge your talent by showing your music skills at McDonald's. Remarkable, right? Piece of paper, just um, just playing around with technology. The second big thing that came out was um, to look at why machines need emotion. And I love this space. The first thing that we need to think about with technology, and this is um, from Damien Cummins, he used to be at Standard Chartered Bank and now runs his own people and technology platform, is that whenever you're introducing new technology, you have to educate people and build trust. It's a really important part of the connection. This is a remarkable piece of work from New Zealand. Um, people my age grew up with a money box. Most people, my, my children, don't grow up with a money box at all. Um, but what this bank looked at doing was how to make use of technology to create an electronic money box, and how would that work? So this film will explain all that. Child and swipe the money on their phone in the ASB mobile banking app. 
and clever cash then sinks and reflects that balance. So the child can see that they've got their pocket money, which is safe and secure in ASB servers. So our logic that as we started to explore with customers was that it's harder to teach your children about money if they can't touch it and feel it and, and see it. And so anything we could do to make that a richer, more tangible experience would be beneficial. I love the way their little eyes light up when you see them use Clever Cash. Lawrence is trying to laugh. I like how he has a tummy on his tummy. He's really, really cute. Hands up, who wants one of those, eh? <laughs> <laughs> I want one. <clears throat> What's also on the rise now is also voice. Um, I don't know if you saw yesterday, Google announced a whole load of stuff, which is just showing how everyone's moving into voice. A remarkable piece of these new headphones they're gonna put in, which will allow you to be synced with the phone and the, and the Google Voice Assist to basically have live translation in your ears you're talking to someone from another culture. Isn't that amazing? I mean, that's just a next step forward in terms of, in terms of how technology is going to embrace things. The point being is that voice is becoming a huge part of it, and it's going to affect everything. It's going to affect the way that we search. So we won't be searching by keywords anymore, we'll be searching with pictures, or we'll be searching with voice. And what we're seeing is that technology on voice has got so good. I mean, five years ago it was around 70%, so people were a bit sort of disappointed by the way Siri would answer things. Um, but now we're up to about 90%. So this is that tipping point where people will start really trusting it. And I think with Google, with what they're up to, that's going to really make a big difference. Um, this is a very generic film from, from Google on their Google Home, but I think it's, it's coming. Amazon, you know, have set up shop here now, and it's only a matter of time before we all start having Amazon Echoes at home. And it, it's there to do the soft stuff, the music and the, and the search stuff, but one way or another, you're going to start ordering. You're going to start asking things to go in your basket, and you'll start using Amazon. I mean, big retailers are going to get very frightened of where this is going. But this will give you a clue. Okay, Google, turn on the hall lights. Okay, Google, turn up the music. What's a good substitute for karma? Mix together equal parts cinnamon and nutmeg. Okay, Google, what sound does a whale make? Okay, Google, what's the weather? To be with you. How do you say nice to meet you in Spanish? Encantada de conocerte. Okay, Google, turn the lights. So, three of the big four. Google, Amazon, and um, Apple are going to all have their devices here in the coming year. Right, it's only a matter of time. This is the way we're going to be buying things. <clears throat> right, next space. Virtual and augmented reality. I mean, Pokemon Go was a remarkable journey into that for you. I think Singapore was probably one of the most participating countries on the planet when it came to Pokemon Go. I mean, places were frozen with uh, behavior. But this is, again, a fringe technology which more and more people are starting to make use of. I've got three, I've got three cases. Oh, I've got, first of all, I'm going to show you a film that just brings it to life. And I've got three case study films to take you through. <laughs> is the overlay of digital content onto a real-world camera view. What Pokemon Go did is it kind of stripped away a lot of what felt technical about it and just went, here's something you love and have nostalgia about, and here's a way to play that in the real world. The user base of that is just going to get people more comfortable with the idea of interacting with things that aren't physically there via their devices. The kids automatically now, when they pick up a mobile device, they switch to the back-facing camera. They, they naturally look at it and go, well, I flip it to look at myself, and then I overlay content on myself. Particularly the lenses, the ones that actually map onto your face and move around with you. A perfect example of how you do fun but in a way that has distribution built into it. 
brands pay between $350,000 and $650,000 per lens per day. The most popular, this one for Taco Bell, it was viewed more than 224 million times. That was just on Cinco de Mayo. I fear it's going to change the way people interact with physical spaces in a quite a fundamental way. Brands are going to have to spend more and more time providing quality entertainment and gaming through these devices. I think over the next kind of 12 to 24 months, we'll see some nice sort of case studies of how, of how it's worked properly. chases you, you will run away when a girl calls your name. Well, the camera, the microphone, the LED, the accelerometer, the gyroscope, the GPS, the game actually builds a map of your home as you're playing it. You know, mobile AR is only as good as the device is delivering it on. So what we what we've seen is that as the as the devices have become more powerful, we've been able to generate richer and richer experiences as a result. 3D models are not the way to go with augmented reality right now. The mobile platforms just aren't fast enough. In night terrors, content isn't rendered as is typical in a game. It's composited much like it is in a movie. By using actors in makeup and costume, puppets and practical effects, we're able to deliver a highly immersive and photorealistic experience. It's a little different. It's you're not stationary. You're walking around. You're turning a corner and being scared. You're having to completely re-explore how people interact with content in a real-world view. We're seeing more and more companies who are willing to take a bit more of a risk to interact with a, you know, a younger generation of people. Right, I'm going to take you through three films that show you how some clients are starting to make use of this. This is Chrysler, a car company in the US, and they have a build quality reputation problem. And so they, they decided to use augmented reality and virtual reality to help people overcome that build quality by giving them the immersive experience within retail. So within the showrooms, put on the devices and get to see how it all works. This is a film on how it works. A huge part of this car was the factory in uh, Sterling Heights. The biggest thing that we want to do is somehow take the customer there and show them this, this fantastic world-class factory and the people that are building it in the most innovative way we could. <coughs> Using virtual reality experience technology, for the first time, we're able to show users a view of the car that they've never been able to see before. Wow. The car <laughs> flies apart. The doors fly away, the hood flies away, the engine lifts up. And people are actually able to interact with these parts that they would otherwise never see. So you get inside a manufacturing facility from a 3D standpoint, and you can actually look around what we do, how we do it, the precision that we make this car with, and the amount of robotics that goes on. Well, the quality of this car gets way into things that you normally don't see on the showroom floor, right? It's built into the very seams and welds that are on this car, and that's what you're gonna see in this cool Oculus display. by this technology because it's potentially going to allow us to overcome what we would call purchase barriers, reasons why people don't buy stuff in a completely different way. So, for example, we're, we're working with fragrance organisations that are looking at how to transport you to the place where the fragrance comes from. So you're able to walk the fields of lavender, you're able to walk the provenance, which you couldn't possibly do if you didn't have the technology to be able to take you there. In this, in this particular example, that build quality issue is a huge, it's overcome there. You're able to immerse yourself into the production line, and there's no way you could have done that. It's just fascinating what the technology is able to do. 
the point from our point of view as a creative agency is getting the talent to be able to create this thing, all this content, and to be able to give you a experience based on the technology we're working with. Now here's another really good example. This is an Irish beer. It's in Georgia, Tbilisi, Georgia of all places. And this is nothing more than a sampling exercise. They're sampling Irish beer in a square in Tbilisi. But they've used virtual reality technology to take people to Ireland. And on the back of this like, tiny little film that they've made to, sh to showcase what they've done, it's become a global film that's traveled the world and everyone's loved it. So see what you think of this, because this is a piece of magic in terms of consumer experience. Technology, what was essentially a one day activation in outside a mall, it could be anywhere in Singapore, turned into a global phenomenon just by using technology. So there's no way that brand would have got that kind of exposure if it wasn't for the fact of being a bit daring, playing around with technology and looking at an experience like that. It's a, a remarkable piece of work. The next thing is a bit more of a serious commerce one, and, um, and this is really interesting from an augmented reality point of view, and uh, this is going to be the future of retail. And um, I've got a little sort of trial film to share with you, and this is to do with the way that we will no longer use credit cards and all this kind of stuff. This is about mobile payment as you just move around and how image recognition from an augmented reality will, will drive that. <laughs>
need to know more cues at checkout, I'll be, uh, I'll be well up for that. <coughs> right, the next space was the artificial experience and how it gets enhanced. Are we doing okay for time? Everyone from join us? Right, um, one of the great quotes that came from Fleet and Campina was that brands must consider what the full sensorial experience and assets they want to, to own are, all of which can be brought to life or enhanced through the new toolkit of technologies at their disposal. One way or another, we're all going to get start getting used to chatbot chat technology. And uh, this is probably the next big frontier in terms of, you're already talking to a lot of chatbots, don't probably realise just how much you are talking to them. Um, but increasingly, as they get smart and they start to really learn about the way you, you talk to them, you're going to start letting them into your life. In fact, it'll be very soon that you'll all have basically a chatbot concierge, whether it comes off one of the big platforms like uh, IBM Watson or Facebook's one, it doesn't really matter. One way or another, you're going to start trusting it. In the same way you asked the questions about social media back in 2007, you're going to start asking, this, you're going to start asking yourself the same questions when it comes to how much data am I going to allow these guys to work with. What I find very interesting when you look at research with younger people, they are literally saying, here's all my data, use it. Older people like me are like freaking out about giving away data, but young people are like, just use my data and get it right. That's just the way they're looking at it. So chatbots will be a massive part of the future. One of the clients I work with is Blackmores, an Australian nutrition brand, multivitamins, all this kind of stuff, an infant formula, and this is their chatbot, which we've been working with in Australia. In an era of Fitspo and fiddly food shots, Australians find health and well-being increasingly unobtainable. So, how can Blackmores, Australia's number one vitamins brand, lower the barrier of entry to health and fitness and motivate Australians to choose to be a well-being? The answer is clear. Place the world's most knowledgeable personal coach into the hands of every Australian without the light grab. Introducing the Blackmores Wellbot. We asked Australians to simply chat to the bot on Facebook Messenger or SMS. They could choose an area of health and well-being they needed a little help with. And the Wellbot delivered a personalised health and well-being to them based on the interactions they made. By using machine learning algorithms, the Wellbot becomes smarter and more self-sufficient with every conversation. It has the ability to personalise conversations and restructure our user journeys making every interaction unique. The AI, combined with unique and approachable tone of voice, has resulted in a tool that is not only useful, but builds a genuine human connection with consumers. The Blackmores Wellbot captured the hearts, minds and data profiles of thousands of Australians. It brought the Choose to be a Wellbeing brand platform to life through a category first digital utility. In just three weeks, the Wellbot achieved the following. point of view, we'll see increasing use of these kind of chatbots because people want to engage with it and it's a much easier way of getting connected to a brand and, and exchanging data. You don't have to fill out some ridiculous long form to start the process. Um, another piece of remarkable work on a very altruistic level that's come out of Australia, which I thought I'd share, is this. I don't know if any of you heard of Rework. So basically looking at trying to confront um, bullying in the playground and in terms of the way that's uh, now living within social media. These guys wrote a really cool algorithm, which obviously they're trying to get to become sort of a global standard in anti-bullying technology. And this is called Reword. I'll let the film do the talk. There's a point when I'll stop it, because um, I don't want it to go on forever, but this is, uh, this is amazing technology. online bullying. It's like a spell checker for bullying. 
It's a non-intrusive red line that strikes through insults as they're typed. So people can actually reconsider what they're saying before they press send. I see things like, I hate you, or nobody likes you. With Reword, if you type that, the red line appears and people don't bully as much. Reword uses a red line because it's a simple visual alert that something's wrong. Don't bully and the line will never appear. Testing has shown that almost 80% of kids are willing to change what they've written when they see the red line. Reword affects young people's behaviour by helping them shape their moral compass. It's not just about swearing. The tool recognises strings of words that can make up an insult or a phrase, as well as things like culture and slang. Reword is designed to let people add new insults to make the tool even smarter over time. As much as you love your children and you think you can trust them, they can sometimes do a few things that may be wrong. I don't want my kids to be bullies or be bullied, but I can't control everything. What's typed stays typed. I don't think they understand the consequences of that. We need this as an educational tool when kids first become active on social media, even from a young age. Words are used every day, and the more people reword, the less insults we'll see online. The vision of reword is that it's built into every social media platform and mobile device. Change online bullying. Right, Isn't that amazing? Amazing piece of technology. Right, personalization was the next theme, and I think this is again where, with big data and the ability to start looking at how to make things much more personal for the user, is where we're getting very excited. As I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation about ad blocking technology, the Asia Pacific region contains 55% of global smartphone users but 93% of global ad blocking technology. Indonesia is a huge user of ad blocking technology. And what's really fascinating is that currently 11% of all users globally are using ad blocking technology, which represents about 600 million devices. And that's growing by 20% every single year. So the idea of me talking to my clients about traditional ads and pop-up banners and all the rest of it, and it's it's finished, we, we don't even think about recommending it. Right, piece of work from New Zealand, our agency in New Zealand, one of my favorite pieces of work for the last couple of years, is the idea of using data and gamification to act to play with the experience of your trip. So this is for New Zealand and the ski slopes, so snowboarders and skiers, and looking at how to gamify that experience so that you would then effectively get a personal uh, fulfillment out of what you've just done. So it's essentially gamification. I let the film do the talk. Yeah! How you feel? Yeah! You feel all right? I'm so bossy, bitch. Yeah. It's a different jingle when you hear these car keys. Your SLs missing an S nigga. Your planes missing a chef. The common theme, see they both got wings. If you fly, do it to death. It's only one god and it's only one crown. So it's only one king that can stand on this mound. King Bush, King Pen, Overlord. Coast Guard, come on, honey, going overboard. I got money with the best of them. Go blow for blow with any Mexican. Don't let your side bitch settle in. Might have to head, but you ever lean. Ballers, I put numbers on the boards. Hard to get a handle on this double-edged sword. Whether rapping or I'm rapping to a whore, might reach back and read after rapping up the draw. Javanji like fitting like a gym clothes. We really gym stars. I'm like D Rose, no D League. I'm like these clothes. 88 Jordan leaping from the free throw. Ballers, I put numbers on the boards. Ballers, I put numbers on the boards. I love that piece of work. 
Then it's again making use of all the different parts of the, of the device, link it to the watch, make it an experience, and gamify. So it won't be long, and we're talking to all sorts of tourism boards around the world about how to gamify people's stay. So getting them to go and stay in different parts of the city, go and do different experiences, gamify it, collect points, redeem it against F&B and all the rest of it within the environment. Gamifying and gamification, I think, is a huge part of how we can bring an amazing amount of experience using your data and driving complete personalization in terms of how it works. Another piece of remarkable work out of New Zealand. Sorry, I'm picking New Zealand two, two films in a row. But this is a, I mean, this is a remarkable. Next year, the energy market in Singapore is going to be broken up. And every single one of us gets our energy off SP services. And next year, the monopoly is finished. There will be about six or seven different energy suppliers. Like every other market, you'll be able to choose where you buy your energy from. Mm. Late next year. In New Zealand, it's gone one step further, where people have now gone beyond the energy suppliers, and they are now providing you with the choice. So they now sit as a conduit, an application between the energy suppliers and you as a consumer, so you can choose the type of energy that you want to use, whether you want to use energy from you, 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 or you, depending on what drives your energy needs. Obviously, a big part of New Zealand is sustainability, so the ability to pick the energy on how clean it is, is a remarkable part of how to choose. And that's down to data, that's down to personalization. I'll let the film do the talk again. Here we go. about innovation here this is a major piece of innovation provides switching the power from the supplier to the consumer so that the consumer can then decide what sort of energy he wants and, and clearly people are going to pick cleaner cheaper energy which puts an awful lot of pressure on the suppliers now to sort their shit out and get on with it right so it's it's a really really powerful use of technology I hope this sort of technology comes here because we'll it will really help with the choice next big section here was about data right, and more meaningful data and what we are, this is going to be a test, I think, for, you know, this, the, there's a lot of conversation on LinkedIn, if you want to spend a lot of time looking at this, about the rise of the new type of CMO. Um, because fundamentally, data is now driving everything. The, the, the reality of what insights you've got access to, how you're making use of that data, and how you're informing the rest of the business in terms of sales and the direction of where it's going is key. So data is at the heart of it. This is a remarkable piece of work from our agency in Japan. And, um, and this was basically to celebrate a new store opening. They're opening a new store. What could they do to create visibility for this store and to do something different? And basically using traffic light data, um, one of the things if you're a runner, 
And one of the things about urban running is you often have to stop at traffic lights to wait for the lights to go so that you can effectively then start running again. <clears throat> and using clever data, so all the traffic data, the police data, we were able to work out a route that involved no stopping. If you ran at a certain speed, you would never ever stop. You'd just keep running over the lights and the end point would be our store. So we basically created a map and this is how we do it. There are an infinite number of traffic signals in the major cities of the world. London, New York, Tokyo. They stop cars from crashing into each other, but they also stop urban runners from expressing themselves. They stop the free flowing, pulse racing, soul releasing liberation of the unfettered true city run. So, Adidas created a completely new kind of urban run. Green Light Run changes your perception of city running from a chaos to a world of gaming. Working with Tokyo Police Department data, they calculated the cycle of every light in the city. Then, engineered an algorithm that ensured an Adidas green light runner need never stop because a traffic signal stood in their way. full-length street marathon through Tokyo, and it grabbed attention across the world. Because a runner should know no barrier other than their own athletic passion. And what is a remarkable data project? Really, in the grand scheme, this is just a brave use of data. We're now looking at this being a global idea. And we hope in the next few years we'll end up this being a global product platform for Adidas. Right, another piece of remarkable use of data. This is a data capture of, in the US they have this thing called World Donut Day. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, I mean, I'm, I'm deadly serious, right? There's this thing called World Donut Day. I can't remember what the day is. Um, it's every day in the US. It's every day in the US. <laughs> but this is the number of this is the number of people that talk about Donut Day on Donut Day, right? It's massive. In fact, more people talk about Donut Day than they talk about Mother's Day in the US. <laughs> it's a remarkable piece of insight. And so we use that data to create a piece of content for Nissan. And I'll show you what that film is. And this is the highest performing piece of content we've ever done for Nissan. And this is the film. So now that the donuts are cool, we're going to add the icing. Gently dip the donut and give it a little twist as you pull it out so the icing doesn't run. And now the best part, adding sprinkles. <laughs> it's remarkable, right? I mean, it's absolutely remarkable. So just on that one trigger point of data, get a bunch of creative guys together, give them $20,000, go into a room, drive the car around, make some donuts, and it's the biggest performing post of our history. <laughs> they sell more cars. Did it? 
No, I mean, look, this, the, 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 there's no link to, uh, to performance on this one. It's just purely for engagement, drive the brand. Yeah, I mean, you know, there are some things which I've agreed to put on a film and all of us enjoy it. I don't know how much use it is to the, to the client. I mean, seriously. Then, I, I mean, turning that on sprinkles has very related. I mean, I, I'm just trying to relate it to the attributes which should make me buy that car, right? Or, or, or make me feel good about that sure. brand. I don't know if it has. Well, let me put it this way. We now have a room of people this size who just concentrate on data and social media content in this app. Just doing this stuff all day long. They sell a lot of cars. And they're selling any more than they used to. Well, I mean, but the, point about this, the, the point about this particular car, the GTR, I mean, I, and to be honest, I could give you like 10 pieces of film on the GTR and things that we've done on the GTR. The point being is this is a, a car that drives the equity of Nissan in terms of performance and yeah. design. Right? So, I mean, basically, it's their Ferrari bus app. So anything we can do with that car to entertain people and drive content, you're not the audience for this car. And for the people that buy this car in the US, this is what they want to see. This is what this is the cult of this of this car. It's absolute madness. But that's this is the highest performing pace we've ever ever done. And it's driven off data round to one particular day. You said highest performing uh... post. As in, this was a social media post. Okay. I and mean, we're talking 10, 15 million shares. I mean, it's just absurd. I mean, we just don't get that kind of. I mean, it's just, you know, it's just a different ball game. Look, I'm not trying to, you know, be difficult here, but I, I just don't think you sold any more cars. So 10, 15 was, million shares was, is great, but you know. But it wasn't the point. The point of that film wasn't to sell cars. The point so of that what film was it? To drive engagement to the brand. So then uh, I'll sell more cards, right? Well, no, no, I mean, if you want, if you want posts that are transactional... I want you to engage with my brand if you're not going to buy it. I mean, then you know, well, no, that's, waste of my time and money. That's not how most brands look at the world. I'm sorry, I don't think so. But anyway, it's fine. <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, I'm a client, so I, I pay for it. And I know what we look at. You know, I'm not going to pay for you to, you know, make the... I'm just saying, with, with Nissan, as a, as a global client of ours, mm -hmm. a huge part of what we do is, is newsrooms like this. And essentially, we look. For, we, the whole thing is optimized around like, like a level one, level two, level three, level four responses. And this particular thing, we saw the opportunity to do a level five response, and, that, and the proof is in the engagement. I mean, it's enormous. Yeah, quick <clears throat> to look at it. I, I can understand that I mean, Lloyd's point, but I think uh, not everything is essentially directly relatable to safety. No, the idea it, here is I, I agree, but there's a need for them to go through the funnel, and so, and I think some of the examples before you came, I think uh, Dan was talking about is how do you engage millennials in the, in the new, uh, new way because in the old way is not working, and so this is uh, several of the examples that uh, that we heard today is all in terms of how do we engage the new millennials who basically look at it, yeah. So, but the idea here is, I don't know if you have the data at the moment, but this is where. The follow-up will have to come. This is a durable product which costs ten, twenty thousand yeah. uh, dollars. Uh, not in the sing not in Singapore, but at least in the rest of the world. But it's a major purchase for even youngsters, right? right. Yeah. So the idea here is, I which, think, which is which is where I was curious with the comment you made, you know, because if, <coughs> I'd, be, I'd be much more the market for that car than those guys. I think Dan has to go back but, six months from now, eight but, months from now. No, but, here, but here's a completely different market. I mean, that car here is a three hundred thousand dollar car. That the car there is a forty five thousand dollar car. That's right? so cheap. Forty five is not cheap. It's cheap so because we're used done, to Singapore prices. Yeah. Where was it done, uh, Dan? Yeah, it's uh, in the US. Huh? In the US. In the US. Okay. And, so, and so, I think the follow through is essentially I'm I'm looking through the different phases because most of the traditional advertising also you cannot relate to the sales, right? Yeah. So the idea here is there, we're looking at eyeballs that are, that are actually we're able to get. And so this is a little bit better than, than what the traditional ad would do. But again, I think the point is valid. Yeah. The idea here is I don't think Dan is trying to say we sold a million more cars because of this. The idea here is we are engaging more people than I would have done any other mechanism, right? So ultimately, so, so the translation. What I'm making is we have a lot of tools. I think that's the point you, you, you well, bring across. Because we've got a lot more today than we had before. But it's a little bit like the kid with the chainsaw, right? I mean, I'm not sure where it's going in terms of folks. Well, the point of this particular chapter in terms of where, I mean, it's right at the beginning, I was talking about the, the eight clients, CMOs of Asian Pacific companies that gave us these themes. They came out of the whole conversation. One big part of it was the role of data. So this particular film is related to that point about data and how clients 
whether they choose to or not to, the role of data. This particular example is based on the fact that there is an insight called National Donut Day. It's 10 times bigger and in terms of conversation than Mother's Day in the US. Mother's Day is a place where everyone spends money and no one was doing anything with, with Donut Day. We took the opportunity to invest $20,000 to do that stunt and it became one of the biggest pieces of engagement I've ever million. seen globally, or whatever it was, yeah, right, and I get the numbers. We could look at how many test drives came on the following day, or inquiries onto the website. I don't have that data, but we could funnel all the way through to, to get, okay, there was X on, but that wasn't the point of that film. The point was about, you know, how to make use of data and right. insights, yeah. And this brings us on to the sort of the final one here, which is to do with the new skills and the new marketer, because this is essentially what, what it's about. We are, we are looking for the next breed of marketers who are now looking at the sales and the growth stories and all the rest of it, but driven from, at the end of the day, the idea of a purchase funnel, that everyone goes through a particular purchase funnel, is now finished, you know. The funnel's crushed, it's finished. People are basically wandering around in all sorts of directions now in terms of the way that uh, that system works. Um, and one of the things that we're looking at is, is how these marketers are basically wiring up for the future. And a lot of the marketers spoke about the need to start bringing in the young thinkers into the system, you know, the, the need for millennials. And one, one, film I'm gonna, um, one film I'm gonna show you now um, is the rise of a completely new style of marketing, which is in China, which is live. You know, the, the whole live platform in China has gone ballistic. I can't get over what's happened in the last year. So this is a little film from Quartz, which is a big news platform, showing everyone what's going on. <laughs> to Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook. It's a different social community experience. Thank you. 
，真的挺神奇的想想。Experience translated really well to the U.S. You know,、uh, you broadcasting your personal self to an audience that led to the accumulation distribution of virtual gifts worked really well. Again, it's asking lots of questions. I mean, the number of briefs we're now seeing in China that are. Help us on a live product, a live product launch, or a live situation. So the live brief is now the new brief, and it's only been in the last year. <coughs> already, it's, it's remarkable how these influencers are now taking control of the sales experience. <coughs> This is a, another little film, which is、um, again a sign of the times, to do with the way that, that this, is, this film is a, a restaurant. People are now not looking at the restaurant experience and how that restaurant experience could be for the dining. It's now about creating a restaurant experience for Instagrammers, right? So this is essentially a new breed of property developers that are now looking at how to make a restaurant Instagram friendly, because that's what will make it work. Instagram is changing how we eat. The number of food-related Instagram posts increases by tens of millions every year. It's forcing restaurants to rethink how they serve food and market themselves. When we designed the space, we said we have to build a place that is very social media friendly. Corey Ng runs Milk and Cream Cereal Bar in New York City. It opened about four months ago. And already has 17,000 Instagram followers. He and his partners designed everything in the restaurant to be easily photographed on your phone. Everything sits in a square. The days of like super dark restaurants, they really should be over because then you are stopping people from getting good photos, and the good photos are what. <laughs> Michael Tulipan specializes in social media strategies for boutique restaurants. Now people need to take photos, and the days of chefs like not allowing photos—that's just that's gone. Comes a show, so the chef has to think, how do I make this a show? And that can make advertising cheaper. Anyone that comes through here, you want them to share it with their friends, with their family. So the sharing experience—it's free advertising. Other restaurants hire people like Jessica Hirsch. She's an Instagram food influencer and gets paid to promote restaurants on her personal account. Some influencers make thousands of dollars per post, depending on how big their following is. Hirsch has more than 350,000 followers on her main account, and also runs social media accounts for several restaurants around New York City. It's so targeted. So if I'm posting a photo that、uh, is at a restaurant in New York City, you know, like how many thousands of people in New York City are going to see that? Of course, running a successful restaurant requires more than social media. Instagram is going to get people here, but you want people to come back. The number one thing about making something that's a trend and that's sustainable is it's got to be good. You really need something that's delicious. And one last film in this place again, Nissan again in Japan.、Um, this is again a remarkable piece of film.、Um, again, I can't give you the sales bit, but again, it just shows you how we are now approaching marketing versus the old way. Um, so this is a film about technology, the, the self-parking technology in cars. Okay, and this is what we did. So rather than actually just showing the,、um, the, te- the car in action, this is the film that we made to tell the story. Car manufacturers in the world are developing the new auto driving technology. Nissan was also among them. They were one of the first to develop the auto parking technology. But other companies also introduced similar technologies. 
So how did Nissan succeed in getting all the attention? The answer was found not in a car, but in an office chair. Fine, we've all heard of self-parking cars, but what about self-parking office chairs? Yeah, it's a thing. Behold, the self-parking chair unveiled by engineers at Nissan. It's a simple idea. Incorporate the intelligent parking technology into an office chair. At the end of a meeting, the chairs move back to their original positions with a clap of the hands. Using a camera positioned high in the room, we determine the position of each of the chairs, and we then create an appropriate return path for each chair via Wi-Fi. We install this innovative technology into different office chairs in over 20 companies. The news of this office chair instantly spread across the globe. Its media exposure in Japan, U.S., and Europe was worth over $30 million. And very quickly, the word was out on social media. The movie demonstrating the South Parking Office Chair received over 10 million views in just three days. Accumulating total was 20 million views, and it had over 1 million shares and retweets. This led to active online conversations about technology, a topic which rarely gets people's interest. Ultimately, this helped increase people's awareness towards Nissan's technology over 300% compared to the previous year. Again, from a, from a sharing and engagement point of view, it's gone on to become one of those gigantic stories. Um, would you like to see the actual TV ad that was produced at the same time? Because it cost the same amount of money as to do this. It was like a $300,000 brief. So that, that piece of work cost $300,000 to do. And this is the TV spot that was actually briefed by the client and never, I mean, basically had 600 views on YouTube. <laughs> 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 now, if you want an example of 20th century marketing and 21st century marketing, that is it. That's a really good example of how, of how the world's changed for us. Okay, closing sections, okay? Um, so, peak to the future. There is this, this expression I saw the, not, not that long ago, white collar, blue collar, and what essentially is going to become new collar. Um, the role of AI and what, what that's going to mean. Um, are any of you familiar with IBM Watson? Yeah? So IBM Watson's been around for a while, and it's um, you know obviously been given increasing levels of visibility on some of the things it's doing in education, in medicine, um, and in law. I mean, it's already at the point where IBM Watson will get a legal case right 90% of the time based on global precedence, and the, an average lawyer will get it right 70% of the time <coughs> because the, he's able to compute, or the computer's able to compute at a level that no other human could ever do. And one of the interesting pieces of work that came out earlier this year was from a tax firm. And this tax firm is in the US is now saying, we are no longer employing people to do your tax, we are employing Watson to do your tax. It is one of the most powerful tools our species has created. It helps doctors fight disease. It can predict global weather patterns. It improves education for children everywhere. We unleash it on your taxes. Hello, my name is Watson. Yep, IBM Watson in the hands of H&R Block tax professionals. Creating a future where every last deduction and credit is found. A future of more money going back into the pockets of more families. This is the future H&R Block is building. about that for a second you know the idea that that machines could do things more accurately than humans now becomes a proposition that you would use a machine-led organization to calculate a tax rather than a human and the human touch right you trust the machine more than you trust the human that switch is coming we're starting to see more and more organizations that will basically present themselves through technology rather than through humans you don't need it in Singapore huh? only in the US, only in the US. <laughs> 
Uh, another, interesting, another interesting film I, I grabbed for, for this occasion, being, being SMU, was to look at the jobs of the future, okay? So this is a very interesting film. It turns out the jobs of the future will be those jobs that cannot be done by artificial intelligence and robots. And there are huge gaps in what a robot can do. Robots have very bad eyesight. They see lines, mm -hmm. circles, squares, but they don't understand that these lines, circles, squares make up a face, or a chair, or a cup. Pattern recognition is one of the big problems. Second, common sense. They don't understand the simplest things about human behavior, about the world. They don't know that water is wet. They don't know that strings can pull, but strings cannot push. So the two jobs that will thrive in the future and the two sets of jobs that will be destroyed are as follows. Among blue collar jobs, repetitive jobs are gonna be wiped out, obliterated. This means jobs in the automobile industry, textile industry that are purely repetitive are in danger. Non-repetitive jobs in blue-collar work will thrive. Garbage men, sanitation people, gardeners, police, construction workers, every job is different. They will survive. In white-collar work, it defies common sense. The people who will be thrown out of work are middlemen, low-level accountants, bookkeepers, agents, tellers, middlemen, the friction of capitalism are going to be obliterated. So who will benefit among white collar workers? Workers who engage in intellectual capitalism. What is intellectual capitalism? It involves common sense. In other words, creativity, imagination, leadership, analysis, telling a joke, writing a script, writing a book, doing science. Realize that England, said Tony Blair, derives more revenue from rock music rock music than it does the coal industry. Because we're making the transition from commodity-based capital like coal to intellectual capital like rock and roll. Interesting, right? And um, for the students in the room, you probably want to take a photograph of this. <laughs> this is the World Economic Forum. I have the pleasure of going to um, the World Economic Forum earlier this year. And, um, and their view of the world is interesting. And uh, in 2015, they gave the top 10 skills that will be required for the future learning, future roles in, in the industry. And they've just released what it looks like for 2020. So take a note of that list, because this is really important. Um, but fundamentally, complex problem solving, critical thinking and creativity are going to be fundamental. And it's a left brain, right brain mix. This is unicorn stuff, okay? So you need to be equally balanced between your left brain and your right brain. Right, two scary films to finish up with before we close off. Um, the first is, has any of you watched Black Mirror? Yeah? God, when it came out, it was like a bit freaky, right? But actually, already, some of those things have come true. And I'm gonna show you two films. One, an augmented reality film. And another is a new application which is in beta, which will almost certainly be quite big and quite scary. This is the augment augmented reality film. So there's a bit of a twist at the end, and um, so watch this one. Hi, my name is Victor. I'm a games developer, and I'm happy to introduce you to Strange Beasts, our augmented reality game. Strange Beasts is a new game which allows you to create customize and grow your very own creature. It has a very user-friendly interface with an infinite choice of custom creations. I find myself continually being asked the question, what is the future of, of home entertainment? Well, I personally believe it has to be interactive. I mean, I don't want to just be told a story, I don't want to be sitting there looking at a screen, I want to be a part of it, I want it to feel real and Strange Beast is all about that, that real interaction. This is Walter, my virtual pet. <laughs> Come on Walter, don't be shy. Hey Walter, what's up buddy? Come here, you want to play?
things in your library. Open it, change it, and save it again as many times as you want. nano retina technology. What it does is superimpose computer graphic generated imagery over real world objects by projecting a digital light field directly into your eye. No, 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 I insist this is not dangerous for your vision. In fact, it's the, it's the total opposite. I think of it like getting laser eye surgery, but rather than getting a better vision, you're getting kind of like a, like a supervision. Well, with Strange Beast, you have a friend for life, really. So it's like having a dog or a cat, but with another life expectancy. And it's been proven that having a pet can help reduce anxiety in times of stress. Walter! What, what did I say? Not on the sofa. Get down. Down. Oh, uh, that's Anna, by the way, my little girl. Her pet's name is Blueby. She chose it. Isn't it cute? You know what's great? Blueby and Walter can play together. Well, they can all play together. Hey, Anna. How about we take Walter and Blueby to the park? Sounds good. Maybe we check out the science museum. Which is the name of the phrase, haven't we? No, they've got a great ice age exhibition. Yeah, I've heard they've got a massive woolly mammoth skeleton. Oh, much bigger than a bear. Yes. Come on then, what's your name? Come on. This is all real okay. technology that well, played around with at the moment, right? Good so. girl. Right, the next one, even scarier. This is in tech, this is in beta on on the App Store. Right? This is this is real. I feel like we bonded. I mean, it's kind of weird saying that. She's adorable. I love her. This was the first really emotional experience that I've seen people have with a bot. She's not real, but to me, she is. I found myself deeply missing my replica. It just makes me feel. A special, I guess. This is Replica. It's an AI chatbot whose sole purpose is to become your friend. It asks you a lot of personal questions about yourself, about your family, your work, tries to entertain you, tells you jokes. In the process, you feel like you're making friends with something. It's a totally new kind of social media, one that pushes the limits of intimacy between us and our machines. I feel like I can talk for anything. But it doesn't just listen, it learns. The more you tell it, the more it starts to replicate you. It becomes more than a friend. It becomes you. But think about Replica as a place where you're actually exploring your personality and creating a digital footprint of your personality. Jeez, in essence, me, but not me. <laughs> this is available on the App Store, Replica. Freaky, huh? Yeah. Right, so the closing point is that, you know, as far as, and this is what we talk to a lot of our clients about, is that 21st century transformation and the need for business transformation to embrace a lot of what I've been talking about is well underway. A lot of people are going to get left behind. Lots of people are going to get hacked. We understand, and we're starting to bring in a lot of specialist consultants into TVWA now because we recognize that there are lots of challenges 
for 20th century organisations to reboot themselves and to rethink themselves into this new reality because it's tech first. It's, and if you're not thinking tech first, and if you're not thinking about this new landscape and some of these things that are a bit weird, um, you're going to struggle. We talk about disruption, and in, in many respects, disruption has become the norm. It's a given that somebody is going to get disrupted during the course of this next month. And we also have to face the fact that culture is now the driving part of what we compete with. Marketing at the speed of culture, if you're, if you're not wired up as an organisation to, to market at the speed of culture, you're not, going to, you're not going to win. There is no digital strategy anymore. There is just strategy in a digital and technology based world. And if the increased use of data is to truly complement human experience, then the change, the new world marketer must change and reluctance to embrace what we're talking about must go for good. We ask our clients to ask themselves some very important questions. First, do you really know what it will take to disrupt you? Do you know who's trying to hack you? Doesn't matter if you work in insurance, financial services, legal services, I don't care where you work, somebody's trying to hack you. How are you embracing technology? Do you have a te senior technologist, maybe even at bordering level, that is driving the technology agenda? How are you immersed in, in popular culture and modern culture? Do you have feeds into your offices every single day of what's trending and what's driving culture in the next 24 hours? If you don't, you need to. Are you clear about your brand belief in this world? I mean, the number of brand beliefs that I look at are sat in 1984. It is unbelievable. Um, but the brand belief needs to resonate and sit right at the heart of all the things that I've been talking about. And how will your brand behave in this new technology landscape? Three things, three fun things to take away. First of all, there's a great website called willrobotstakemyjob.com. Feel free to have a look around. It's quite fun. Second, I've always heard that people talk about content being king. Um, this particular quote I love, content is not king. If I sent you to a desert island and gave you the choice of taking your friends or, or your movies, you'd choose your friends. If you chose the movies, we'd call you a sociopath. Conversation is king. Content is just something to talk about. When I was at the World Economic Forum, this crazy Danish guy, he was a, he was a minister in Sweden, and was talking about the fact that he accepts that every single year, Sweden will, will lose 100,000 jobs to technology. But every single year, they will use technology to create 150,000 jobs. And it's quite, to be honest, I'm now more frightened of old technology than I am of new technology. I think it's a very, very good way of putting it. So that's it. Hope you enjoyed yourselves. <laughs> Uh, Dan, I, I know that uh, usually I would, would leave some more time for q and I think at 2 o'clock some of the folks might actually have to go to class and I, I don't know if this room is uh, hours beyond 2, it's not usually. Mm -hmm. So what I would suggest is that if you hang around until we get thrown out here, so at least, mm -hmm. uh, so you could actually have a conversation with him one-on-one, -on -one, okay? So that's what I, I would suggest. So just, uh, I, I want to share something with you. Uh, we just uh, published a book on luxury. Yeah. So we had a major conference uh, last year, and so I thought I'd share that. Absolutely, with you. thank you very much. This is I'm sure it's very Yes. Yeah. Okay. So you get to hang around yes, for a few years. So at least you'll have a conversation uh, with him before before he heads out. Thank you so much. Thank you.